Good evening. This is wonderful. It is such an honor and a privilege to welcome all of you to the 2014 Big Bang Gala. Our theme is Explore. And I am Meg Lauman, your new inaugural Chief of Science and Sustainability. I look like a butterfly. <laughs> I have metamorphosed from the East Coast to the West. I think next year I'll come as a caterpillar, so watch for me. <laughs> um, I have one word to respond to the opportunity to be your leader in this amazing new mission at the Academy, and it's wow. I'll say it again, wow, it's so exciting to be here, and I'm really thrilled. So thanks again. Fasten your seatbelts or your harnesses, depending on what your activities are, um, and we're going to have a wonderful evening together and a wonderful decade of amazing change coming ahead. Raise your hand if you've ever climbed a tree. Oh my gosh, what a good class. So all of you are explorers. All of you have actually been in my habitat. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I was one of the first scientists to climb a tree and find out that half of the biodiversity in the planet on land lives at the top of the tree. So that means all of you have explored a global hotspot. Congratulations. Um, hopefully you might continue to explore with academy scientists in the future. It's amazing to think about this, but in the 1950s, SCUBA was developed, which offered an opportunity for marine research. In the 1960s, NASA took us to the moon, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we climbed trees in our own backyard and found half of the world's biodiversity. So it's pretty amazing how much still is left to explore and discover. So why would I have left a tenured job to come here and hang out with all of you guys? Um, I do think the Academy now is so poised for amazing things to happen. This mission, explore, explain, and sustain, is going to be life-changing, I think, as a platform for museums, for public institutions. Our kids need us to do this. Our grandkids definitely do. And I think it's a really exciting moment in science education that we can be a leader in bringing scientists together with young people. And this will be an incredible chapter for the Academy as a global leader. Secondly, I think that um, this community of San Francisco is probably one of the only places on Earth where such innovative and wonderful change could take place. And, all of you collectively have made this place buzz and hum or fly, whatever the case may be. It's very, very transformational. So we as a staff are so excited and so thankful to have this community to partner with. This evening's insightful conversation is called A Renewable Horizon, and it features some extraordinary people that you are going to really enjoy, and I'm very humbled and honored to be on this stage introducing our guests. So first of all, we have, oh, left to right, um, Tom, who is retired as the head of Farallon Capital Management has dedicated himself to the issue of climate change and advanced energy. As an investor, philanthropist, and Californian, he is actively engaged in climate politics, economic development, and environmental protection. And I think he's a pretty good rancher, too. Um, joining Tom in this conversation is Harvard professor and inventor Dan Nocera. Um, as a canopy biologist myself, Dan is one of my lifelong heroes because he deals with the artificial leaf, not the real one. And he was recently profiled by the New York Times as well as many scientific journals for pioneering this amazing artificial leaf, an invention that generates hydrogen from water using solar power to mim mimic photosynthesis. Our moderator, who is infamous to all of you, is Greg Dalton, who founded and hosts the Commonwealth Club's Climate One. On my first day of work last December, I attended one of his presentations. It was so awesome. The Academy would also like to thank 
Franklin Templeton Investments for the cocktail reception and Wells Fargo for sponsoring our insightful conversation tonight. This discussion is about a half hour long, so for those of you whose drink is running dry, fear not. Um, at which time at the end of this conversation, the staff will lead you to the dinner tent and everything will be looked after. So thank you on behalf of my children and your children and grandchildren for your support of this academy. Thanks for sharing this mission and please join me in welcoming tonight's distinguished speakers, Tom Steyer, Dan Nocera, and Greg Dalton. Well, thank you, Meg. It's, I'm honored to be here. I've conducted lots of interviews, but never, never with a cheetah looking over my shoulder. So <laughs> this is going to be a first, and I'm going to keep an eye on that cheetah over there. But we're going to hear from Dan and Tom first uh, about your stories and, and how you came to where you are, and then we're going to talk about energy and sustainability, and then end by talking about some things we can all do and what, what we can do more. So Dan, I'd like to start with you. When did you first know that you were an explorer and wanted to pursue energy, and particularly clean energy? Um, so I have a very sad story. I used to move around a lot. And I woke up one morning and I found out my house was being sold. And I was only like eight years old. That drives you to science because <laughs> You make friends and then they just evaporate that morning. <laughs> and so uh, actually what you just said about, so I used to go on field trips as a little boy and what I would do is just say I'm going to go out my backyard and just take one square foot of earth and there was this thing called Heath Kits where you would build your own stuff and so I would build my own microscope and just do an exploration of one foot of earth. And by the way, I think everybody should go on that field trip still. It's kind of neat. Um, and then I just went on because I had this pathetic childhood. And um, <laughs> I, I embraced science. And it turned out uh, and I went to graduate school around the oil crisis. And I got enamored by energy. And the only thing I ever wanted to do was take sunlight and split water to hydrogen and oxygen. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> and I did it. So thank, <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> but then the world went away from energy, and I started at 24 years old doing these calculations. And I saw it was a locomotive coming down the track, and I realized how much trouble we were in. And I never left that mission. So that's basically the short story of it. And we'll get back to that hydrogen split off from water uh, later. But Tom, you came to energy later in life. How did you go from being an investor in fossil fuels, an investor in the tar sands, to being an advocate against fossil fuels and for clean energy? Well, I still think of myself as an investor, basically. Mike. Is it on? Yeah. I still think of myself as an investor. And I think it's a little unfair to be in this room with people who've known me for the last 50 years so that I can't make up this story. <laughs> I wouldn't, I'm not saying I'm resentful, but I'm very <laughs> disappointed. Um, I, th the, I think about energy and climate exactly the way that I, I think about all investment, which is you're sitting there taking in information and trying to put it together to organize it into a way that makes sense. And in general, when I did that in the 30 years that I was an investor, I felt as if in political issues in the United States, something would come up, people would say it was an incredible problem. The newspapers and politicians would scream and yell. I would ignore it, and it would basically get solved. And that happened with acid rain. It happened with the hole in the ozone layer. There were a number of problems through the years, through Democratic administrations and Republican administrations, with lots of screaming and yelling, where basically, problems that people felt were incredibly important got solved over time by the American democracy. And the reason that I changed what I was doing and felt that I had to leave my job, which I loved, with a bunch of people in this room who remained my close friends was it didn't seem, reading the newspaper and following it, as if we were solving the problem. And I felt as if it's normal for generations to face something that's difficult 
it's nor I think that if you look back at American history, it's absolutely typical for a generation to be faced by some sort of problem that absolutely challenges them, that is absolutely new, and that requires a new kind of organization and a new kind of commitment. And I made the decision whether I'm right or wrong, only time will tell, that this was it. And that I wanted to be one of the people who was going to try and figure out how to solve this problem. And that it was, since I thought it was the problem that was going to define our generation, I felt like it was really a chance for me to do something that I cared a lot about and, and basically, hopefully, have a lot of fun working on it and feel as if we'd come to a place that was better at the end. And as you look at the problem, do you think it's a, a, a problem of the economic system? Is it the political system? Is it our cognitive systems? Is it all of those? No, it's a pretty simple problem, actually. Without teasing. I, you know, I love Dan Nocera, and he, you're going to find out how brilliant he really is. But this isn't really a science problem in terms of analyzing what, what the problem is. There are plenty of science and engineering innovation that needs to be done that's critical. But basically, the science question is largely resolved as to what's happening. And it's not a policy issue either. Because by and large, American society has solved large-scale pollution problems very successfully, almost exclusively under Republican administrations, by the way. This is a political problem. It, we can't seem to do what we've done in the past, which is to come to grips with it and act together and basically put in root policies that make a level playing field, that make polluters pay, and let the private sector innov innovate our way out of this. You know, our scientists, our engineers, our business people, in my opinion, are fantastic. I'm still a full-scale believer in the American private enterprise system to solve problems. But to solve a problem, they have to have a, a, pol a computer program that they're using that includes all the costs and all the relevant facts. And once they do, they will optimize and create and innovate in ways that will shock us all. But until they have all the information in that computer program, they'll optimize the wrong thing. So I, I think this is a straightforward problem that is extremely complex. The politics are extremely complex, but what has to happen is not difficult to figure out. Dan, you have a slightly different view. You think that there's a lot of innovation that needs to happen, a lot of discovery. Yeah. that we don't. Some people say we have all the technology, we just need to fund it and deploy it, and you think we need new innovation. Yeah, yeah. so there's two pieces of this. What Tom said is it's not a science problem anymore. What he meant by that was you guys are in big trouble. <laughs> All right, so climate change is here, and there's going to be huge consequences. That's what Tom meant when he said, this isn't a science problem anymore. We all agree with that. The cause. The co and, and we have a problem. You know, Houston control, we have a problem. So that part, science is, it's not a science problem anymore, and it's become a policy problem. On the other side of the coin, it is a free market. And there are real price points. And the real challenge here is, and actually, I would love to publish a paper with somebody out there because there's some people in here who could do this calculation. But you guys have spent a huge amount of money in 150 years to build your energy system, right? So you've built the power plants, and you have mining companies, and you have railroads, and you have a grid, and guess what? You paid it off. So it's paid off. It's free now. And so you guys pay for really cheap energy because you paid off your investment. And what I say is science still hasn't been good enough in that very tough market condition, which nobody will be. You know, I, the public writes to me all the time, please, no, sir, invent something and save us. There's no scientist is going to invent anything against a hundred. I'm guessing it's somewhere between a 70 to 100 trillion dollar investment in energy and you've already paid it off. So there's nothing any one person's going to do and that's what Tom's saying. It's got to be policy and a political will to start leveling the field. But science hasn't been good enough still to drive the cost down with invention to at least get in the ballpark for uh, a competitive market. But so this is, a tough, this is a tough problem. 
Is that science's fault, though, or is that a market failure where the market is distorted? I think, Tom, you would say, right, the polluters get rewarded, and there needs to be, there's these is market failure. Well, I, what Dan is, is saying, I think, is this. Look, the energy we use is a complete commodity. When you turn on your lights in the morning, all you care about is whether your light turns on and the cost. You don't know what the source of that energy is. A BTU is a BTU whether it comes from coal or nuclear or hydro or natural gas or renewables. So really what's going on is we have costs and they're comparing them very rigorously. But when you think about the cost per kilowatt hour of coal, it doesn't include some of the costs that are very real but that you don't pay for. So for instance, you don't really pay for the health costs of the people who live within a mile of a coal plant. But that doesn't mean those people don't get sick and have to go to, the get, go to the hospital and their kids don't have asthma. They do. And it turns out that coal, if it costs five or six cents a kilowatt hour, the health costs are four cents. And they don't pay any cost for the carbon dioxide that they emit. So that's also free. So the, it's not a question of whether coal is good or bad. It's a question of if we included all the costs, would it still be cheap? I always say to people, if I ran a garbage disposal business, and my garbage disposal business was to pick up your garbage and dump it in Dan Nocera's yard, I could make a lot of money. Because, and personally, it would be great. I would love that. <laughs> but <if laughs> Steyer's always dumping in my yard. Yeah. <laughs> but if I had to pay to dump in Dan's yard, which I do, and people love subsidies. So once I've been doing, dumping in Dan's yard for two years, I think I have a right to dump in his yard. And if you say, now I have to pay for it, I'm upset because I'm used to making the money and it's all good for me. So all I'm saying is make people pay for dumping in Dan Nocera's yard and then let people compare with all the costs included and let people innovate new ways to deliver this commodity. And they will. You know, I, the, the other thing I'd say to Northern Californians is this. In 1983, when I graduated from business school, they broke up Ma Bell. So I'm, I'm looking at you guys, you all look very young compared to me, but some of you will remember they broke up Ma Bell, and in 1996, they deregulated the communications industry. So in 1983, for those of you who remember my parents, they were using a rotary phone and watching a black and white TV. In 2014, there have been 10,000 innovations as a result, but in 1983, there had been very, very few innovations for 100 years. You know what? Alexander Graham Bell would have been at home in my parents' kitchen with that rotary phone. Thomas Edison would be pretty much at home with our electricity system right now. We need to do that system and let people innovate, like Dan, who, who are thinking in new ways and blowing our minds the way that Northern California has blown our minds in terms of IT. And what are some of the key areas where the biggest innovation needs to happen, Dan? Is it energy storage? What else, where would you... Do the yeah. big bets need to be hit, made? I'll just say one thing. It, it's all energy storage. So energy isn't a commodity for power companies because if you're generating it renewably, um, they can't store it. So if you can't store it, you can't deal it. You can't make money off of it. So the day you have cheap storage, it will be like Gillette razors, right? You'll get the Gillette razor for free. You'll get the solar. The, Power companies could probably encourage you to put solar panels on your house because you'll be generating energy for them that they could sell. So there's two pieces of this. Your world, which is your world, and, and I know if there are any psychiatrists out there, please don't come up and tell me how distorted I am because I always say I separate myself from the world I live in. I know. I'm really having problems and I'm trying hard to work through. <laughs> So in your world, um, if I could give you storage, a power company like SoCal Edison, they would in be encouraging you for renewables. So it's really energy storage. The real world for energy is the people we can't see, which are the poor. Because right now there are three billion people who haven't been born. There's three billion super low energy users. There's 1.6 billion people today who have never seen one electron in a wire. So you're going to have 6 billion new energy users. We can't see them. And if they adopt our energy system, and you think you're in trouble now, just wait. 
and it's all within 35 years from now. So think about a kid that you know, and they are going to need energy, and they really need the type of energy I'm talking about. And again, it's storage, because if I could give them storage, they could generate energy locally. And then, by the way, the poor, and sometimes I see this on the web and I hate it, because I wish I was this nice of a person. They say, oh, look at Nosarath, he's helping the poor. I am not helping the poor at all. The poor will help you because you are stuck with the hundred and the Thomas Edison energy system. Luckily, the poor don't have anything. They will be the early adopters like they've done with cell phones and everything else, and they're gonna teach you how to live for the future. So when you look at the poor, they will be your saviors. And the way they're gonna save you is they're gonna adopt a different energy system and it's all to do with storage. As soon as they can store energy from sun or wind, they're gonna be good to go, and they don't have to build your $110 trillion energy infrastructure. And are we gonna see some big energy storage innovations in California anytime soon, Dan? Um, I think you are. This, this, so now we get back to policy, the PUC, Public Utilities Commission. This $2 billion thing that California just did has been huge. Um, in the ground floor of this, there are major Fortune 100 companies who haven't been in energy coming out of the woodwork now saying there's a real market. It's been created by policy, but there's $2 billion in California right now to do energy storage by 2016, and some huge players are coming out of the woodwork to say we want to be in the business of energy. They haven't been before, and they will be. So this is a perfect case of what Tom has just been talking about. And as usual, you know, I'm on the East Coast. I'm always jealous of damn California because once again, uh, because of some really forward-thinking policy, all of a sudden energy storage is on the playing field because of PUC. Tom, you picked a fight with big oil. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> Well, not to be rude, but which one? <laughs> Big, which, which one, people? Which fight? Uh, Keystone. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure most people know there is a proposed pipeline from the Alberta oil sands uh, to go to the Gulf of Mexico to Port Arthur, Texas. And it requires a State Department approval because it goes from Canada to the United States and there's been a controversy. It was initially proposed in 2010. Uh, it was expected to be kind of a six to nine month approval. And the president last week just uh, announced that he was not going to make a decision until they had a right of way in Nebraska, which is currently hung up and will probably won't be decided by the Nebraska Supreme Court until January of 2015. So in terms of how is it going, uh, let me say this, there are two things that I would say. One is, I think the president is very deliberately trying to think about this. He has said his criterion for approving this pipeline is that it not enable uh, substantially more carbon pollution. That, he said that a, about nine months ago in a speech at Georgetown. And we have taken the position, which I absolutely believe, that it will enable the development of these oil sands to a much greater degree. So I'm strongly opposed to the idea of this pipeline. But I would say something different. People are framing this as either we should or should not build this pipeline. And I don't see it that way at all. I think the question is, should we continue doing fossil fuel based energy, including this kind of fossil fuel where they're basically strip mining the boreal forest to turn out some very dirty oil or should we do something different and go for an innovation-based, research-based, advanced energy program, which we are fully capable of doing and which will take care of our climate problems and be way better for us economically? So I don't view this as an up or down on this specific pipeline, even though I think the pipeline in and of itself does enable the strip mining of this uh, these oil sands and it's a terrible idea and I could go through you know longer than you guys want to hear but I think there's something else going on which is it's time for us 
to decide to go a different direction and take into account the science that we all know and bet that our scientists and our engineers and our business people are fully capable of taking into account all the costs and we will have a much more successful and self-determined system when we make that decision. So I see Keystone as a chance for the president to put the United States on a different path long term and really enable us to lead the world in a different direction that we inevitably have to go on and which we will deserve, he will deserve an amazing amount of credit for framing that question that way and putting us on that path. And when people look back 50 years from now, they will say that was a brilliant and important decision. It would be a symbolic decision, but what is it, a $6 billion project is pretty small in the overall energy scheme. What can be done to get more private money and public money into clean energy, more capital flowing? Because the VCs got burned on clean energy. They pulled back. It's a, it's a tough sell to get private money to clean energy right now when there's not a market there, as Dan has said. Well, I'd say two things. Let's distinguish the research part of R&D and the investment part. So the research part of R&D traditionally has been done by the United States government. They funded the internet at DOD. That's where the research was. They are the people who can look 20 years out and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on primary research that benefits all of our society. And it's, very it's a very important governmental function, and we've done it at least since the beginning of the Second World War. The second part has to do with the investment into advanced energy. My point is, once they include all the costs, I don't care where they come out. You know, people in the clean energy area always say to me that there is a so-called valley of death, like there isn't enough money in the financial system to take care of these projects, which for all the people who I've worked with in the financial system know, that is not true. People are really hungry for good opportunities. What there is is a shortage of revenues in clean energy because if you, unless it's a level playing field, they can't generate the revenues to justify the investment. So we really get back to the question of, we have to put in place the proper policies, and the, in, the technology will follow, and the investment will follow. Dan, is that right? That policy needs to be in place, a price on carbon for the kind of innovations that you and your students work on to really have a chance in a marketplace that's more <coughs> fair? Um, it definitely will accelerate things, but I, I really feel, and I'm starting to see it now, so if you're a defense contractor, that money is starting to shrink, right? So when you start looking at people, by the way, nobody, I'm, I just wanted to say this tonight, no oil company's trying to kill me, okay? So uh, just so I can dispel that question in case anybody <laughs> has it. Um, for some odd reason, they, they always believe the oil companies are out to kill me. The oil companies could care less. I wish they want, I told Tom once, I wish they wanted to kill me because then I know I would be close. But, um, Do they want to kill him? <laughs> they, they definitely want to get him. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the real, so this, this whole, this innovation issue, we can do it. I mean, I got to tell Tom, we will do it, science and engineering, but you do need this, massive investment you guys have made, you have to start uh, leveling the playing field. You have to, there's no, there's no singular discovery. I wish I could tell you there's a silver bullet. I wish I could tell you the artificial leaf is gonna save your life. What the artificial leaf tells you is there's hope that people are discovering and doing things. The artificial leaf, even 15 years ago, was called the holy grail of science. And then we did it, and I don't feel very holy anymore. You know, it, 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 it just happened, because that's what scientists do. So we will do it, but what Tom is saying, you need to put wind in the sails for change. And, and you have a very well-endowed energy system that you've paid off, and there's no way you can compete without having some, or dealing with these issues that Tom's raising. There's just no way you can do it. What role can the military play? in this transition, they've often led in civil rights yeah. in some respects and from uh, wind to, uh, to yeah. coal to... Yeah, so the military can definitely do things because military is usually an early adopter that doesn't have an ROI. So if you ask me what killed in a, kills innovation in the US, it's ROIs of four to six years. 
That's what we're really dealing CFO with. CFO is doing it. Yeah. If you go to the developing world, I deal with a man in India. He has an ROI of around 20 years, and he built India, his family, okay, Mr. Tata. So when Mr. Tata looks at India, he's not looking at an ROI of four to six years. So ROI is the death knell. Military doesn't have an OR, ROI of four to six years. So they're always early adopters, and they can do things way ahead. And I will tell you, my friend is now the energy secretary, Ernie Moniz from MIT. Um, and they have DOE and the D DOD have been trying to start these partnerships because of this ROI problem. So basically, the military is free of ROI. And Tom, you were, I think, involved in the financial, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, which is trying to relax some of those, not to get too wonky here, but trying to get at that ROI problem. Yes, let, let me make one point about the military, too. Because down at Stanford, I've sat in a two-day meeting where every single service came in and talked about what they were trying to do in clean tech. And they didn't do it just because they thought it was a nice idea. They partially did it because it's mission critical. When you think about delivering oil to the front line in Iraq, it ends up costing $200 a gallon, and half of the people who've died in Iraq have died delivering energy to the front line. And if you think about it, you're going, you're in a big obvious thing. It's extreme, you know, that's how you're putting yourself at risk so that the people on the front line can have generators and can be doing their jobs. So for the military, this is not something where they're trying to get a good deal, do the world a favor. It's mission critical to who they are and what they're trying to do. In, so I just want to make a point. They're one of the biggest allies looking forward. They're also a huge energy user. The US military is the single biggest user of energy in the United States by a factor. So in terms of SASB, I, so I can bore you about accounting. Um, Basically, one of the things we believe is this idea that it should be a level playing field and that investors, the idea is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't measure it, you can't value it. So what we've been pushing for is for important measurements of different environmental standards to, to get people to put them into their annual reports and quarterly reports so investors can decide if they matter. And if investors think they're stupid, it doesn't matter, and managers can ignore them. And if investors think this is something that is going to affect the value of the corporation and its ability to make money going forward, then they're going to change how they value that company, and managers are going to pay a ton of attention. So all, really what we're doing in SASB, which is the S Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, is say, put in relevant information and let the managers and the market figure out what the value is, and they'll figure out whether they should change the way they're behaving based on the idea of whether people think it's important. I want to talk about solar, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up on, and get to some individual action points. Solar is a big success story. There's been more solar uh, adopted in the last, installed in the last 18 months than the last 30 years. Uh, Dan Nocera, that was partly technological innovation, but it was also financial innovation. So we want to talk about the financial component to technological innovation, creating, again, funding flows to technology. Yep. So um, the reason why solar is penetrating is because of communism. It's that simple. Um, China decided they were going to own the market in silicon. And they decided they were going to just build billion dollar plants to churn out silicon. And so the biggest, there's been lots of changes in my life. I was talking to Tom before we started. The first is, before the Iraqi war, if I talked, I turned left or right and asked anybody about energy, they would say, what? You know, if, if you're in Boston in a Boston bar. That's, that's how I decide all of my, by the way. So <laughs> if I'm in a Boston bar and I look left and right and say, tell me your view of energy, you would get like, maybe I would get punched. That would be the nicest thing that would happen to me. Um, now, anywhere I walk, I, I, you guys should all try this. Just no matter where you at, are, just ask somebody about energy at the grocery. Everybody has an opinion. So that's one huge change. But the other big change, 
was, and this is where I really, I'm, you know, at the end I'm a science geek and I think scientists and engineers, we can invent and change anything. But in 2006, every policy, every single thing Tom's talking about that people set market was, silicon would deliver energy at $4 per watt. It, that was the number in 2006. Only, that was only less than 10 years ago. It is now under a dollar. You guys will be at 50 cents, okay? And that's because China is churning out the silicon now because they made the CapEx investment. And that's why I say storage is so important now. If you get storage, it's gonna take off. And so the other huge investment is solar has got a foothold because there's now places to get silicon and it's under a dollar. You guys, it's actually to your benefit in lots of places in California to own it. If you live in Hawaii, it's definitely to your benefit because shipping coal to Hawaii is really expensive. And so the world's changing fast right now. It's just people don't know it. I can't see it. As we get to the end here, I want to bring this home to the individual level and ask each of you how you manage your own carbon footprint. Tom, you have a, a there's going to be a parade of Teslas out of this place tonight, but you, you're not driving a Tesla. I am driving a 12-year-old uh, Honda Hybrid, which if anyone would like to buy, it's for sale. <laughs> And let me say, if it seems like a low bid, I won't be insulted. <laughs> um, we actually, it's, it's funny, Catherine Taylor and I did a uh, carbon footprint to see how we were doing. And, you know, there are, you can buy these offsets, and, and we do, which is basically, I, I'm not sure how much confidence I have in it, but the idea is that you can offset anything you do. But we wanted to see what we were doing, and we've tried to be really thoughtful in, in terms of our lifestyle to see where we're, using, uh, where we're using energy and emitting carbon and where we're not. It turned out we were doing a great job with two exceptions, one good and one bad. We both travel a lot. So when we looked at our carbon footprint, you know, we have solar on the roof, we do all the things that uh, you would think would be responsible, but we both travel a lot and there's no way getting around it. So even though we always fly commercial, as a way of reducing that, that was an overwhelming amount of our footprint. And the second thing was, we have been doing this huge carbon experiment at our ranch down in Pescadero, seeing whether we can change the, how much carbon gets sequestered in the soil as a result of the way that we raise animals. So I was hoping in looking at this, that the two, that the carbon sequestration, which we're trying to measure, would much more than offset the fact that we fly, and I do understand the irony of flying to try and do something about carbon while emitting carbon. Dan? Okay, so I don't even want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reason why. Because it's just what Tom said. Carbon is an intrinsic part of our lifestyle, and now up in our heads we have to make a decision. And the thing that bothers me is First, let me say the good part. If you're doing something individually, that's great because you need the social awareness. But it's a little fly, a little flea on the elephant, okay? You have to decide, and all of you have to, and we all came here tonight and you're listening to two jokesters, so that's great. And you might have a Tesla, and that's not gonna solve the problem. It's gotta be total change. And I worry sometimes that we get too comfortable where we do a little thing at home, which really, when you, we're looking at terawatts of energy we're worried about, that we then say, that, that absolves me from everything and I can go home and feel happy. And so I don't even like going down that road because I'm gonna tell any of you right now, you can't do anything, anything, to offset the problem we're talking about unless you have a political will and you want to change how we live globally. But Tom, is 
that political will will be supported by culture and people changing the way they live and buying a Tesla sends a market signal. There's an alternative to petroleum. You can get powered by sun on your roof. So I'm not buying that, but maybe Tom. Let, let me make two points, and, and I basically do agree with Dan Nocera, but we make two points. I think people think that they change their attitude and then they change their behavior, but I think actually you change your behavior and that changes your attitude. But the fact of the matter is I would liken this issue as a challenge to American society to World War II. And in World War II, people did keep victory gardens. You know, people around the country felt it would be better that they voluntarily grow their own food and did a variety of things to show that they were supportive of the war effort and were doing everything they could. But we did not win World War II because people had victory gardens. We won World War II because we shut down Detroit and didn't make any private cars. We made tanks, we made airplanes, we made destroyers. We changed our society. We sent people overseas carrying guns. Women went to work in factories. We made a decision that that was what we had to do. And that is why we won World War II. And that is what Dan is saying is, if we want to change this, we need to have the will, we actually have to be organized enough and decide it's high enough on our urgency scale that we will make the kinds of changes that will let us do what we're perfectly capable of doing, that we actually will feel incredibly good about when we look back, and we're not actually asking anybody to take a gun and have to go overseas to another continent. We're asking people to be organized politically and insist that we do something different as a society. And actually the place in the United States that is the most forward thinking on this is San Francisco, California. So when we look around about who is going to lead here, who is actually going to f make people think differently, lead the way, it is the crazy people of San Francisco, California, like the people in this room. And so, I mean, what Dan was really saying was, it isn't okay to feel like I drive a Tesla and that's my contribution. We are going to have to insist on a change. You know, it, there is this, one, one of the movies I really love is uh, about these, you know, you guys have all seen it, Chariots of Fire. And, you know, in, in that, the guy doesn't want to run on Sunday because it's the Sabbath. And they pull together all the people who are running the British Olympic Committee and they're talking about what to do and they kind of think they have an answer. And one guy turns to the other and says, well, we should call up the committee. And the other guy goes, you fool, we are the committee. <laughs> that's the case here. There is no one else for us to turn to. There is no place else in the United States where the leadership is going to come from if it actually doesn't come from the people literally in this room. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, this is the most aware city in the United States. You guys know this better. We're the best educated city in the United States. This is, a city, this is a city that traditionally and actually looks forward without being nervous and flinching, that thinks that we do overcome problems and that, it's, it, that that's a fun part of life, that's not a horrible part of life. And unless we insist on this happening and accept the, the you know, mantle of being crazies, which seems to be something that I have accepted fully, we will not win. And let me say, Dan is as crazy a guy as you're ever going to meet. It is dinner time, so I think we need to end it there and thank uh, both of you gentlemen. Very well said. Thank you both. It was a lot of fun. Is that a good one? Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Good job. I think that was a good So the question is, did, did I convince the conservative friends of mine? That's my law.